title today to share with you is be careful when you look back. Be careful when you look back. In this past year, we had some tremendous accomplishments. We had some hard times. We had some days where we laughed together, days where we cried together, days where we wept and just put our hands in our uh, our face in our hands and didn't know what to do. Days where we sat around conference tables and just said, Lord, if you don't come through, we're wrecked. Huh? I mean, there's been good times and bad times and ups and downs, and I I believe it's in order to have a look back, but I think we have to be careful how we look back. Um, It was Satchel Paige, the great baseball player who paved the way for blacks in the uh, major leagues. He was made famous by the saying, don't look back. Because something might be gaining on you. But long before Satchel Paige ever gave this advice, the Apostle Paul had said something to Christian folks in uh, so many words many days ago. Basically, he was saying, don't look back. I say to you, let's be careful how we look back. For Paul writes in his letter to the Philippians in chapter 3 and verse 13 of Philippians, brethren, I do not consider that I have made it on my own. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward, looking forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So God's word to us is be careful how you look back. Now, I'm going to explain that because I know you're wondering, why is he saying be careful? We look back because we need to understand. In fact, isn't there a place in the Bible where he said that our children would ask, what does these stones mean? Well, the thing is, it's good to look back, but you must be careful how you look back because sometimes we will highlight parts of our history and that becomes a memorial for us and sometimes in a bad way. Let me explain. Let me explain. Uh, It is natural tendency for us as human beings to want to look back. In fact, Life magazine has what they call the year in pictures. Sports Illustrated has the year in sports. We have history books. We have photo albums. We have photo stream. We have home movies and memories and theaters and all of these things at our disposal whereby we can take a gander back into our past. And I want to say this. I believe there can be great value. Every football coach would tell you it is great to look back. It's great to look back at how we played this team so that we can see what we did right and also so that we can correct what we did wrong. I would suggest to you today as we close 2014 and we get ready to dive into 2015 that we look back over the year and the years gone by and we look at the things that we did well and we applaud it and we say thank God that we did something right. And we also look at the things that we didn't do so well and say what can we do differently? What can we do Better. So there is a great value when we can look back. <clears throat> we can uh, see the places we've been. We can see the faces and the circumstances that we've come through and the, the people that we have known. Let me give you an illustration. In his book, The Sacred Journey, Frederick Buchner writes, It's mainly for some clue where I'm going that I search through where I've been for some hint as to who I'm becoming or failing to become that I delve into what I used to be. So there it is. There is indeed a time for you and I to look back if that looking back carries with it some advantage, if it carries with it some positive purpose. So at the same time, Paul says, forget what lies behind you. There's a saying that says, what's done What's done is done, and it is what? That's right. And so, um, it, but I think we need to learn from what has been done. I'll say this. I'll never leave another piece of wood on a table saw, I mean on a chop saw, because of breaking my thumb. And I look back, and I look into the future right now and say, that was a dumb mistake. Are you all with me? Say amen. 
Thank you. Paul is not saying don't look back, but he says be careful how we look back. Don't look back in a way that will make you, listen, a prisoner to your past. Don't look back in a way that, that will enslave you or enslave others. Looking back in the wrong way does not allow the healing of old hurts and painful memories. Because if we look back far enough, you're going to find a time when you were hurt, when you were offended, when you were upset, when you didn't get your way, when someone took you the wrong way or perceived your best intentions the wrong way. And maybe you receive them the wrong way. If you don't have to look far till you get to a place where you say, man, there was some pain there. So we have to be careful how we look back. I want you to imagine with me how miserable the Apostle Paul would be if the Apostle lived in his past. In fact, the Apostle Paul, his name was Saul of Tarsus, and he was one of the most formidable enemies of the early church. Think about it. Before his conversion, he was the arch enemy of the church. He was responsible for the gruesome persecution and even the murder of people who professed a faith in Jesus Christ. When Stephen, the first counselor in the church, he was a great witness for Christ. He was stoned to death. Luke tells us that Saul stood there consenting unto his death. In Acts, Luke goes on to say that a great persecution had arisen against the church. And Saul was ravaging the church and entering house to house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. So if the Apostle Paul were to look into his past and try to live in that moment, if he tried to live in that memory of the past, it would eat him alive. He would say, I could never do anything with the church because I have persecuted the church. He would say, I can't love Christians the way I should because I killed Christians. They're never going to trust me because of what I did. No. But he said, I forget those things that are behind me. And I count all the things that I've achieved, uh, achieved but dung. That I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. Are you with me? Say amen. Paul's past was cluttered with atrocious acts of evil. He wasn't perfect. And even after he became a Christian, he still said, I struggle with this old flesh that I have. I want to do good, but the good that I want to do, I don't do. And that that I do not want to do, I find myself doing. Who shall deliver me from this old body of death, from this old flesh? He said, but I'll tell you this, I strive every day. Day to keep myself in check. I crucify the old man every day so that after preaching the gospel to others, I myself might not become a castaway. Yet Paul was forgiven. Through the grace of God, Paul was forgiven. He affirmed it in his letter to the Colossians. He said, He who has delivered us from the dominion of darkness, He has transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son, in whom we have redemption and forgiveness of sins. Listen, Paul was able to forget the awfulness of his past because God had forgotten the awfulness of his past. The Bible says, He removes our sins as far as the east is from the west, never to be remembered no more. So if God is able to forget our past that we've asked Him to forgive us of, then we ought to be able to forgive ourselves and we ought to be able to forgive others. The first one was easy. We can often forgive ourselves and, and uh, lower the bar for us while we hold other people to a greater expectation. We magnify their sins under a microscope and look at ours through a telescope. They're way out there somewhere. Are y'all hearing me say amen? There's no need to be um, enslaved to the mistakes and the sins and the shortcomings of our past. We don't. I know we're looking back, and I'm gonna tell you something. There's times in this this year in 2015 or 14 that I've blown it, that I've messed up. It, there's moments that I would have liked to had back, but I can't uh, get a mulligan on that. I can't redo it. All I can do is say, God, please forgive me. If I've offended anybody, I can say, please forgive me. If you've offended me, I can say, I forgive you. And we can go on and lay the past behind us and move forward in the kingdom of God. Amen. That was a great place for an applause, to be honest with you. But we don't have to continually feel guilty. 
and second rate because of something that we did yesterday or last year or the year before or for something that we're caring about that has been done to us that we have no control over. Some of you have been abused when you were a child. Some of you were abused when you were an adult. And you don't have any control over it, but you live with guilt. You live with that agony and that memory again and again and again. I'm telling you, you don't have to live with that. You don't have to have the shame of that. But the Bible says, whom the Son has set free is free indeed. It's as simple as that. Listen, we, and I know, say, Pastor, don't, don't simplify my... I'm not trying to say that what you endured or, or the plight that you had was easy. I'm not saying that. I'm simply saying this, that God is bigger than that. Amen. So neither should we look back at the past mistakes and the sins of other people. God has forgiven us and we ought to forgive one another. In his excellent book, Healing for the Damaged Emotions, David Seaman says, Many years ago I was driven to the conclusion that there are two major causes of most emotional problems among Christians, and here they are. Number one, the failure to understand, receive, and live out God's unconditional grace and forgiveness, and secondly, the failure to give out that unconditional love, forgiveness, and grace to other people. That's a mouthful right there. Listen, we can never build a lasting relationship. We can never relate truly as we should to one another and the way Christ wants us to until we forget what lies behind. That's why I urge you this morning to look back, but be careful how you look back. Let me take it a little further. At our best, we are all sinners saved by grace at best. We all make mistakes. We all hurt one another at times in this life. But God helps us to forget what's behind us. And therefore, He can help us to forget that somebody else has hurt us because they are human too. Mm. (laughs) Felt that one bounce a little bit. Amen. The Bible says, listen, here's some words that God gave to us, husbands and wives and brothers. He says, the word to husbands and wives, to brothers and sisters in Christ, to friends and family is, don't look back. Don't look back on those words that were spoken in a moment of anger. Don't look back on those actions that hurt us. Don't look back on those mistakes that we all make. Because if we'll be honest with ourselves, we have also made some mistakes. We have also spoken out of turn. We have also put our foot in our mouth, sometimes both of them. Amen. So instead, let us be, the Bible said, kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God forgave us in Christ Jesus. Don't look back. So forget what lies behind us. Listen, I, I don't want you to forget it entirely. I want you to remember some things. But don't get locked up in the past. Let, let me address that. Don't look back on the painful memories. See, we've all got those moments in our lives that that, that we experience that haunts us and it hurts us and we've got these memories of difficult times and we have a tendency to play it over and over. Did you know something? This right here is the greatest computer ever made. Amen? It is the greatest hard drive ever made. It is the greatest recorder of events. These eyes and these ears and this nose and... You know, I can see and smell and hear. It records in the finest, ultra, high definition. It records it on the, the, the drive of my mind and my brain. And I can remember every hurtful word. I can remember the snarling look. I can remember the growl in the voice. And you can too. We can remember the, the, the slightest detail. Maybe if it's a victory, you killed your trophy buck this year. You can remember that and you relive it. And those are wonderful things. And maybe you married the bride of your dreams and you can relive it and that's wonderful. But, but in our mind, that you know, we can play it again and again and again. But the devil would have you play again and again the things that you don't need to hear again and again. There are things we need to delete, but we just can't delete it. Are you hearing me say Amen. Uh, Let me give you another illustration. Charles Dickens had the pitiful character in Great Expectations. Miss Havisham was her name. 
a person who was never able to overcome the painful memories. Let me share. Miss Havisham experienced the trauma of being jilted on her wedding day. Her fiancé left her waiting at the altar. On that day, Miss Havisham's life stopped. The clocks in her house stopped. Her wedding cake was decorated with cobwebs. And Miss Havisham never recovered because she couldn't keep from looking back. She resigned herself to live in a past so painfully filled with memories that she couldn't change. You see, no, we can't always turn off the reruns of the painful memories, but God helps us to do what we cannot do by ourselves. In that I am weak, He is strong. Amen. In that I can't, He can. For what is impossible with man is possible with God. So He is able to free us from the miserable memories. He's able, you know, maybe it is still there, but we don't have to pull it up and rehash it. See, the memory of a painful, unhappy childhood, the memory of a love that was lost, the memory of a traumatic happening in our lives, the memory of a tragedy that we've experienced. The memories may not be healed overnight, but I say to you, they can be healed. Listen, we can leave them behind us and go on. I'm not saying we can go back and change history. We can't change it. But as the Lord told Israel, watch this, when they were suffering in captivity, He said to Israel, Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. So many times we, here's the the tragedy of looking back, is that we get caught up in what it used to be. And we feel like that what it used to be is what it ought to be and what it always should be. And we define our present day success and all future successes based on what used to be success. Another great place for an amen. I'm not talking about getting saved will always be getting saved. Repenting will always be repenting. Receiving the love of God and the grace of God, the, the, the salvation, the baptism in His Spirit, receiving these things, and that is never going to change. I'm simply saying we as human beings, we fix our mind on certain trophies of the past, certain memorials of the past, and we say to ourselves, if it's not that way, it'll never be right. I'll give you an example. In the, in the 60s, Bus ministry in churches was booming. You had one in the 70s here. Uh, Amazing from what I look back and see. But bus ministry by and large on the scale it was then is no more. Tent revivals in the 50s and 60s when Oral Roberts was in his heyday. And man, T.L. Lowry was in their heyday. Man, that was the going thing. And I've sat on sawdust floors under a tent. I've seen it. I've been there. I've heard the singing and sings. That's another thing. We used to have gospel sings every weekend somewhere. And, and if we're not careful, we can say, now that was victory. That is what it ought to always be. And if we're not careful, we'll, we'll lock ourselves into the prison of a memory. Tradition is wonderful in its right place. Are you all hearing me say amen? Jesus warned us that we be careful not to take the tradition of men and call it the commandment of God. Listen, we, listen, we cannot live in the past and still fully be alive today. There is even the ever-present temptation for us to look back at our accomplishments without accepting the new challenges that lie ahead. So be careful. I'm going to tell you something. We don't do ministry. I had a guy tell me, and he no longer attends, but... Uh, in his parting days, he said to me, Pastor, you've changed. This is a couple years ago. Well, a year and a half ago. Right after we came here. You've changed. I said, you know what? I sure have, and you have too. Amen. The gospel hasn't changed. The word of God hasn't changed. But I'm telling you, if you think you ain't changing, go home and get a photo album out. If you think you ain't changing, look in your driveway and see if you're still driving the 1966 Plymouth you used to have. Look at your shoes and see if you're not wearing some updated shoes. No, everything changes. And I understand, certainly. listen, we must be relevant to this day and age or we become irrelevant, period. Wow. So listen, it is good for us to celebrate our successes. But I want to tell you something, even as a church, the, the, the things that got us to this point here won't be what gets us 
forward. I mean, yes, we're going to still preach. We're still going to teach. We're going to do all of these things. But I'm telling you, we have constantly got to be uh, seeking what the next new thing that God wants to do is. We cannot be content with where we've come from. It's about where we're going. Especially true for the church. We can never rest on our laurels, our past achievements. We can never point, uh, and, and, you know, if we ever reach a point where we're constantly looking back. Let me say this. You know where you look back at? You go to a museum to look back. Amen. You go to used to be's to look back. I was in South Carolina a number of years ago, and I went on board. I can't remember the name of the, is it the Clamagore, the, the, the submarine that's there? I, I don't remember. But anyway, it, it's a museum now. I've gone aboard some aircraft carriers that are museums now. Th- these are relics of the past. These are things that in their heyday, they were great, but they are no more. So looking back has a place, and it ought to be something temporary where we take a gander. We just look back, but then we realize that was then and this is now, and that's tomorrow. Faith, for us, it's an expectant faith, one that always points to the future. As Christians, we should never, listen to me, I'm going to hurt somebody right here, I guarantee you. Lord, I'm going to get some phone calls, but I'm going to say it anyway. We cannot just long for the good old days. Because really and truly, some of the good old days wasn't really all that good at the time. What it is, is your memory has decided to take the best of the good old days and and glean the best of the good old days and not think about the hard times of the good old days. Are y'all with me? Say amen. A church that that looks back constantly instead of looking ahead isn't going anywhere. Listen, you can glance in your rearview mirror, but you better stare out your windshield. The windshield is this big and the mirror is this big. Why? Because you need to spend more time looking out the glass, seeing where you're going, than looking where you've been. As individuals with a church, and that goes for all of our accomplishments as well. We, we could sit here and say, well, praise God, we built a beautiful building. Well, praise God. What's next? Hello? Well, we did something great in the kids' wing. And, okay, what's next? We, that we can never, listen, as long as we're living, we have to be ready to go forward. See, Paul paints a picture of a runner. He's straining. He's pushing. He's trying. He's striving. He's doing everything he can do to move forward in Jesus Christ. He's doing all that he can do. He said, don't you know that everybody competes? But the one that really strives, the one that really trains, that's the one that's going to make. See, Paul's goal is to become more like Christ. I know he had a sketchy past. I know he done some terrible things to the church. I know he hurt some people. He killed some people. He cannot make those things right. What do you think when he went to Stephen's family if he ever met them? You reckon they sat on the same side of the room in church? You reckon they took communion together? You reckon they held grudges forever? I'm sure it hurt. I'm sure it did. Even Paul and Peter themselves got into a debate, and boy, we're going to have a good time next week. We'll have a good time next week. Paul and Peter got into a debate about the Jews and the Gentiles and whether they should eat with washed hands or unwashed hands or whatever. And the Bible said they, come, they didn't come to blows, but they come to a place where they couldn't reside together. So Paul agreed to minister to the Gentiles, and Peter agreed to minister to the Jews, and they would still be brothers, and both of them are stalwarts in the community of faith. Generals in the army of God. Are you with me? Say amen. Well, so Paul's goal is to become more like Christ in every thought and every action. He forgets. Watch this. Here's what I want you to forget as you stand with me. He forgets the mistakes. Some of you got some mistakes right now. I want you to get ready to forget them. I said, Pastor, I can't forget. Let me tell you something. Everybody makes mistakes. Are you hearing me? I've made some mistakes that cost some money. Those are usually the ones that you remember. Huh? I won't ever forget when I was cropping tobacco on a, or actually we were spraying tobacco. It was growing. My uncle, Ralph, <clears throat> I was working for him. I was about 10th, 11th grade in high school. He was on the tractor. Uh, planning and so on and so forth. Well, I had the chemicals right there beside the truck, a 
gallon of this and five gallons of that. And uh, I didn't know how much them chemicals cost, but just one of those containers was like over $200. Concentrate that you then mix on the big tank in front of the tractor and spray the crops. And the other one was very expensive as well. Bottom line is he looks at me from the tractor and says, move the truck so I can turn around. I get in the truck, pay no attention to that, and back right over two bottles of those chemicals. Two bottles in 1983. Man, did I get the butt chewing of my life. Are y'all hearing me if I can say that? I'm telling you, it was a costly mistake. And I was wanting to say, Uncle Ralph, just be calm. <laughs> but it don't work that way. And you've made mistakes that cost you money. You've made mistakes that cost your company money. You know what? But we're human beings. You've made mistakes that cost face and reputation. And I've made mistakes that cost reputation. I, I, you have and I have and we've all. So forget the mistakes. Forget the sins. Once you've asked the Lord to forgive you of them. The memories and even the accomplishments. Don't get so wrapped up in the accomplishments that we think, well, we're the cock of the walk. Praise God. We need to forget all of these things and focus on the goal ahead. Yes, we set records this year. Yes, we took in a lot of people. Yes, a lot of people got saved. Yes, a lot of people hooked up with the church and began to work in the church and began to give to the church and began to dream with the church. Great. What are we going to do next year? You see, because the Lord may come in January. He may come in June or July or, or 2016 or 17 or 20 or whatever. But I am to work and occupy until He comes. Amen. He's coming for somebody that is busy. Listen, I read this in the Hebrew letter. Therefore we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely. And let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him, He endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God getting those things that are behind us. So let me ask you this. What lies ahead for you this year? My heads are bowed. Eyes are closed. What lies ahead for you this year? What challenge will you face this year? What are you willing to... Or are you just happy to bask in what you did this past year? Maybe you had a great year. What lies ahead for us as a church? Listen, you are, you are the church. What lies ahead for us this year? Are we happy to be doing what we're doing? But do we need to do something greater this year? Do we need to reach more loss this year than we've ever lost, uh, than we've ever won before? Yes, we do. Do we need to baptize more converts than ever before? Yes. Why? Because we've got more people to work with than we've ever had before. We have greater facilities than we've ever had before. Too much is given, much is required. So. Are we willing and ready to press forward for the goal of becoming the person and the church that God intends us to be? If you've not shared your faith as you ought to, this year's your opportunity. In the book of Genesis, listen, we find a vivid story. And I'm going to close with this. The vivid story illustrates the dangers of looking back. God just pronounced judgment on the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. He's about to destroy it with fire and brimstone. In the meantime, God's messenger angel comes to Lot, tells Lot and his family and children to get out. Get out. God's about to rain fire and destruction down upon Sodom and Gomorrah. Flee for your life. Do not look back or stop anywhere in the valley. Flee to the hills lest you be consumed. Lot and his wife and two daughters leave behind their home and fire and brimstone begins to rain down on Sodom and Gomorrah. And then the unexpected happens. The writer of Genesis says, but Lot's wife looked back and became a pillar of salt. Now, I, there's a whole message that goes with that, and I don't have time to preach it to you. But she did not take a, I, I submit to you that she did not take a gander back at the house and, or, or, or just a fleeting pass. But I believe it was a look with a longing for what was happening in Sodom and Gomorrah. A look with a longing for what used to be. And she was judged immediately for it. The message for us is this. Don't look back. 
don't look so intently back that you cannot look for the future. Jesus said, no man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Brethren, I do not consider, Paul said, myself to have made it on my own. This one thing I do, I forget the things that are behind me and I look forward to what lies ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the call of God in Christ Jesus.